Hi, everybody. Welcome back to asymptotics and perturbation methods. So our topic today is uh, saddle points, an extension of the method of steepest descent that we discussed in lecture six. So let me just jump right into it. Uh, if you want to read in Bender and Orsog about this, you can look on pages starting around 288. Um, so our topic is these um, so-called Laplace integrals which are integrals of this form, some function, uh, analytic function of a complex variable t, and then times e to the x rho, um, where rho is itself a um, function of a complex variable t, an analytic function. And as usual, we're interested in asymptotic behavior as some parameter x tends to infinity. Right, so okay, so I've got this row, which the notation you'll remember hopefully from last time, we've got a real part phi and an imaginary part psi. Um, we write u plus iv for the real and imaginary parts of this complex variable t. Okay, so we're looking at this kind of integral and what we had pointed out in lecture six was that um, there's a very clever method where you can essentially keep the phase psi constant by restricting attention to living on contours of constant psi in the, um, in the T plane. And so the strategy is to deform the original integral, which is taking place here on the real line from A to B. If you can deform it to lie on uh, contours of constant psi, then this problem up here will reduce to something that is amenable to Laplace's method discussed several lectures ago. And so we said that the method of steepest descent could really be thought of as the method of constant imaginary part, you know, method of constant psi, um, and that those are equivalent formulations. So that was all mentioned in lecture six. But now uh, the key idea for allowing us to use Laplace's method is that points where this function phi, the real part, achieves its maximum, the neighborhood of those points dominates in its contribution to the integral. And so we can just restrict attention to the infinitesimal neighborhoods of those points. Now, when we did that in the last lecture, we did an example where the points of maximum phi were endpoints of a contour happening here and here in the example we did. Um, what we're gonna explore now is what happens if we have an interior maximum rather than endpoint maxima. That's where this idea of saddle points will come into play. So our question for today, what if the function phi has an interior maximum um, along one of these constant psi contours, which I'm showing here in blue schematically. So if I've got this constant psi contour, and then I think about how the function phi varies along here, and let's suppose it achieves a maximum at some point that I'll call T zero. What can we say about that point T zero? There's an interesting inference we can make about it, knowing two things about it, that it lies on a curve of constant psi and that we have a max of phi at this point. So watch what we can conclude. Let's think of this um, tangent vector here, I'll call it T hat, capital T hat, the unit tangent vector at that point. And let me think about the directional derivative of the function phi that I'm interested in, the one that has the max, what's its directional derivative if we move along um, this direction? I mean, for one thing, let's look at the imaginary part. I mean, psi has a zero directional derivative along this direction of the tangent vector because we're moving along a contour. So psi is not changing. Um, infinitesimally as we move along this curve of constant psi. So this is certainly true that in the direction of this tangent vector, there's no first order change in psi, but also, so think of the, the letter S as being like arc length along this curve. Um, so we're parameterizing by S, but also the interesting point is that the function phi itself has no change to first order as we move in the direction T hat, because we're assuming we have a maximum an interior maximum at this point T zero. And so both functions have zero derivative with respect to S when we move in this direction of T hat. And so then when you put those two together, 
then dds of phi plus i psi will also have a zero derivative in this direction, t hat, which is interesting because that tells us that the analytic function that we're making from phi plus i psi, the thing that we called rho, itself satisfies d rho ds now is zero in the direction t hat. And that has a big implication because we've been assuming that this function rho is an analytic function of a complex variable. And so if its derivative is zero in some specific direction t hat, by the definition of analyticity, its derivative is the same in all directions, right? That's what it means for a function to be analytic, that as you let, so to speak, h go to zero in the usual definition of a derivative, um, it doesn't matter which direction you let h go to zero. It can go in any direction in the complex plane, they all give the same derivative at the base point. So this, this assumption that rho is analytic means that d rho dt has to be zero, not just in the direction t hat, but in all directions. And, and therefore, um, we can conclude that rho prime, the derivative, is zero at this point, zero. And that's what we mean by a saddle point, a function, a, a point at which a function um, has zero derivative. So we can conclude that this t zero is such a point. It's a saddle point if we have what we've been assuming that phi has an interior maximum along a constant psi contour. So that's our little definition then, a point T zero where rho prime of T zero is zero is a saddle point. Um, I think that's as far as I've written out ahead of time. Um, let me explain now why it's called a saddle point geometrically, but um, maybe I'll just pause here for a second. Is there any question about anything? Maybe you already know why it's a saddle point. But in case you haven't thought about these things before, let's talk about that for a second. So actually, let's do it by way of a, a simple example. Um, let me pick a specific function rho. What we can work with, suppose, um, a row of t is i t squared which is actually the row that we considered in the last lecture. So that's the row that we had in lecture six. Nice little quadratic function. Um, then, um, well, for one thing, row prime of t, d2it, is equal to zero at the origin. So we have a saddle point there. But let's think about this in terms of real and imaginary parts. Um, if I write out this function rho, which I'm saying is i t squared, and now I'll write u plus i v for t and square it, then you get i times u squared minus v squared. Um, and then there's a cross term, which looks like two i u v times i. So that becomes negative two u v. So we can read off our function phi as the real part. That would be negative two u v. And psi is the imaginary part, u squared minus v squared. Okay, so, um, What's going on at the origin? I mean, if we try to think locally what's happening, uh, we're going to have essentially a saddle surface if we were to graph um, either phi as a function of u and v or psi as a function of u and v. Both of these quadratic expressions give us saddle surfaces. So let's talk about that in a little more detail and try to connect it to the um, curves of constant psi in particular, because those are, we know, the curves of steepest descent. So um, the curves of steepest descent, and for that matter, ascent, I mean, the curves along which psi um, for the function phi, which is the function we're interested in, it's change. Curves of steepest descent and ascent for phi 
Um, we know from last time satisfy, they are contours of the other function psi. And so if I'm interested in the curve of steepest descent through this point phi, equal, uh, sorry, through the point uh, at the origin, um, let's see what's going on there. So at the point t equals zero at the origin, um, we have of course u and v equals zero. And so the value of psi would be zero. And so the contour we're interested in that goes through this point that we're calling a saddle point um, would be the contour psi equals zero, which will satisfy u squared minus v squared is zero. In other words, it's what we had last time that we're getting a pair of straight lines. U is plus or minus V is the, um, the contour of interest. So if I draw a picture, let's see here, try to draw the UV plane. I'm trying to explain what, what does any of this have to do with saddles? All right, so let's draw in blue some of these contours. Here's, um, this is one of the contours for psi equals zero, and then there's another one going through like that. And, um, Let's try to understand which of these is descending. I mean, where's this curve of steepest descent? If you were standing at the origin and you wanted to go downhill in phi, which way is pointing downhill? So to think about that, um, sorry, let's put that in black. Um, Which of these lines gives us the path of steepest descent in the function phi? As we move away from the origin. Well, to figure that out, we just figure, let's look at what happens on one of them. Um, well, I don't know. Uh, actually, I mean, there are various ways we could think about it. We could look at the contours of, let's do that. Let's look at the contours of the other function. I mean, this is a typical contour, like say this would be, or phi equals negative one, because remember, what is phi? Phi is the function um, negative two uv. So we have those negative signs floating around, but uv equals a half would be something that looks like this red orthogonal hyperbola to, to these lines. Um, if I went out farther, I'd have something like this. This might be phi equals negative two. And you can see I'm going downhill as I move along the blue curve, the blue straight line. So this is actually a downhill direction with the arrow pointing this way. Right? And, and also you could check that you're going downhill if you go this way. So I'm gonna use this kind of notation to mean, if I draw something like this, that's a, um, gonna be my notation for points downhill in the function um, phi. 
Also, we could check this analytically by just writing it out in detail. Um, I mean, on, so on the line U equals V, phi, which we said was minus two, UV would just um, degenerate to minus two U squared. And you can see that as you increase U, you're going down, right? Phi becomes more negative. Um, as you increase for positive U and then for negative U, you gotta go away from the origin in the other way. Okay, so those are curves of steepest descent, that line. Um, whereas this along here would be and if I wanted high values of high values of phi are occurring over there um, on contours that look like that. And so if we we're interested in descending along that particular curve, that I should say straight line, there we we be descending going this way or this way. So you can see from that pattern that what we're drawing is something that looks like a saddle. I mean, qualitatively, it looks sort of like you know, something like this. Or what I'm trying to indicate is something that looks like a saddle surface where you could go downhill this way or around the back. Here's the saddle point I'm interested in. Um, I don't know if that's a dramatic enough saddle for you. But then, you know, if you want to go uphill, you would go this way. Okay. So anyway, that's the point that, that we've got something that really is like a saddle surface behavior in terms of the function um, phi that we're interested in. And so we are focusing on the downhill direction. It's a very schematic. representation of what's going on. Okay, so that's the setup. Now, what does any of this have to do with asymptotic evaluation of integrals? I wanna focus on one exercise for the whole time, the rest of the time, which is, um, you may remember back when we were doing the method of stationary phase, which I think was lecture five maybe, we, um, we found a really nice one term in the asymptotic expansion of Bessel's function J zero, but that was all that we could get one term because that's a limitation of the method of stationary phase. You just get the leading term. So here with this new method using saddle points and steepest descent, we can get the full asymptotic expansion of J zero. And I wanna show you how you would do that. So um, this is discussed also in the book or something very similar to it. So if you wanna check the Bender and Orsog treatment, take a look at, um, especially pages 291 to 94. All right, so let's remember, we have this nice integral representation of the Bessel function J zero as one over pi integral zero to pi cosine of X sine t dt, which for our purposes, it's convenient to write it as, you know, in terms of something that looks like a Laplace integral, um, one over pi, the real part of the integral zero to pi. And then we'll use an e, so e to the i x sine t dt. Um, And we saw that uh, stationary phase, I'll let me remind you, is 
stationary phase gave us this nice result that um, J zero of X was asymptotic to big square root two over pi X. So that one over square root of X we know is characteristic of the, it's typical anyway of stationary phase calculations. So we had two over pi X inside a square root then cosine X minus pi over four as X goes to infinity. So that's the leading behavior of the Bessel function as it damps out as X gets large. And um, so now we're gonna to try to obtain the higher order terms to this, the corrections to this. Higher order terms in the asymptotic expansion. via saddle points. All right, so that's our goal. Okay, so to do that, let us focus on what we've got going on here. I've got this uh, term in the exponent. And remember rho is the thing that's being multiplied by X in the exponent. So in our notation um, here, we're dealing with the case of rho of t is i sine t. And our original contour, now thinking in the complex plane, well, we're going from zero to pi in the t plane, so that's the uv plane. And so, um, There's our original contour, right? That little piece of the real axis. Now we want to deform that to something that lives on curves of constant psi. That's the method of stationary, sorry, method of steepest descent. So let's try to pursue that. Um, so let us try to pick new contour such that um, the imaginary part of rho, I mean, after all that's psi, is the imaginary part of rho, which in this case would be um, just sine t. Or sorry, it's the imaginary part of i sine t is constant. on each piece of the contour. We saw last time that sometimes the contour may have to have several pieces and may have different constants on the different pieces. Or we might even have some pieces that where psi is not constant, but they won't cause us any harm if we can ensure that they'll go to zero, often by letting some other, you know, deforming some contour out to infinity in some direction. So we, we have to be alert for those opportunities. Okay, so in this case, um, what we're interested in is, so the imaginary part of I sine T, that is we're interested in places where sine of T equals constant. Now, what does that look like? You have to remember that T is a complex variable. So this is saying we want level sets of the function sine of U plus IV. Um, wait, it's not that I want um, sine t to be constant. I want the imaginary part of I sine t. Let me be more careful here. Uh, yeah, hold on a second. Maybe, uh, yeah, let me take out this line. Let me just expand what is sine of t. Okay, using a trig identity here. Sine of t, um, the usual trig identity 
is still correct, even though we're in the world of complex numbers. So I would get um, sine of u, cosine iv plus cosine of u, sine of iv. And then by using um, Euler's formula, um, you can check or just plugging in however you want to do this. Cosine of iv, that turns out to be cosh. So I have sine of u, cosh of v. So hyperbolic cosine, and then plus i cosine of u. When you plug in sine of iv into the definition of sine, um, you'll end up getting sinh of v. And so what we were interested in up here was imaginary part of i sine t equals constant. So if I take i in front of my sine t and then look at the imaginary part, it's gonna be this part. This is the real part for sine t, but it will be the imaginary part of i sine t, right? Because of the extra factor of i. So um, the imaginary part of i sine t, which is what we're calling psi, is this expression sine u cosh v. And just for posterity, it'll be useful to record phi. Um, when we do i sine t, the i times the i right here, i times that i will make a negative one. So phi comes out to be negative cosine of u sinh of v, which we will need soon enough. But okay, so let's record these um, for little facts. Okay, how are we doing? You wanna ask anything at this stage? All good? Just setting it up, yeah? Okay, all right, so let's keep plugging along. All right, so what do we need to do now? We we're thinking about deforming our contour and we want to deform it onto the contours of this interesting function, sine u cosh v. All right, so, um, well, let's look again at the contour. There it is in blue. And uh, if we want to deform it so that it lies on contours, Remember, we, we got to, it's nailed down at the endpoints. We don't get to move those points. We get to deform the interior part, but not the, I mean, think of it like an elastic band stuck between those two endpoints. So we should note what is the value of psi at these endpoints, because that's going to determine what contour we're going to be on. So if you just look, um, when we're at the origin, u is zero. And so sine of u is zero. And so the function psi will be zero. In fact, that's true at both endpoints because at the other endpoint, u is pi and sine of pi is also zero. So we're um, dealing with contours where psi equals zero. Um, so where we have u equals zero and u equals pi, meanwhile, v is zero at those places. We get that psi, which we said is sine u cosh v, that will be zero. So let's think about the contour where um, psi is zero. Well, hmm. all right, so that's a little bit puzzling because cosh is never zero, right? If you remember what the cosh function looks like, cosh as a function of V is something like this. Cosh is never zero, its lowest value is one. Uh, 
So in order for psi to be zero, you need It's the lines where either u is zero or u is pi. So we have vertical lines. That is, um, in my picture in the plane, uh, let's try that again. I like that to be straight, okay. So here's u equals pi, here's u equals zero, v is going up. Um, what we're saying is we're interested in contours that lie along here and here. And remember what we're trying to do is deform something that had been going like this into something that lives, you know, sort of on here. <laughs> And on here. Now that looks like that's going to cause a continuity problem, but that's because we have some kind of bridge that we haven't discussed yet. What we're really going to do is think about going like maybe way up here, then do some kind of bridging thing to get over here and then go on here. Actually, um, we're going to find, I'll just jump ahead, we're going to find that there's a saddle point right in the middle. And so what would really be nice is to find a way to go along one of these contours, then do something that doesn't contribute anything to the integral, then go through the saddle point, then do something else that isn't gonna to contribute to the integral, and then finally come back to our endpoint along that other contour. It'll have to be something qualitatively like that, or it could conceivably be you know, maybe like this and down here and then through the saddle point and then up here and then over here and then down. We have to try to figure out what's gonna work. And so remember what we're trying to do is go downhill. We want, if possible, to follow curves of steepest descent. And so since we started here, let's see which way we have to do to go downhill. Do we go this way or do we go this way? That's our first question. So let's ask which way is descending, starting at the origin. So which way is descending? Remember this always refers to in the other function in phi. Um, at the point, let's say at the this first point zero zero. Okay, well, to figure that out, we have to write down phi. So recall that phi is, we said negative cosine of u cinch of v. And so on the um, contour, the vertical line here where u is equal to zero. Con it's a psi contour, of course. Um, when u is zero, that's giving us, I'm just plugging in u equals zero, phi becomes negative cinch v because, um, cosine of zero is one. Okay, so if I have negative cinch V as a function of V that looks like this. And so that tells me if I wanna go downhill from the origin, I need to be going this way. That is towards positive V which is indicating that the correct move up in this picture is to go like so. Start here and deform the contour in the direction of positive V, go this way. That's going downhill.
Um, so this is gonna be a part of the new contour. Follow that reasoning so far? That we have to go like that. Well, okay. Um, yeah. Now, if I do the same thing about at the other end point, it's gonna turn out that um, this is gonna be a piece of the contour but the arrows here, remember, mean which way is downhill in the function phi. It's going to come out like that. We can calculate that. I mean, why don't we just quickly check that? I mean, that's how it's going to turn out. So let's look over there. Um, so at pi zero, what do we have? Then psi equals zero again is our contour. We know that's the vertical line. U equals pi is our contour. We already said that. But um, at that place, when you plug in to this expression up here for phi, when U is pi, cosine of pi is negative one, the negative sign in front makes that positive one. So there we have phi equals sinh phi on that contour. And so since sinh looks like that <coughs> in V, to go downhill, we need to go towards negative V this way. which means back in this picture, it's what I said, to go downhill from pi, you gotta go that way. So that should be a piece of the contour as well. And that's a little bit confusing to think about how are you going to deform this, this interval topologically, you know, again, thinking of it as an elastic band. If I start trying to pull this part up this way, but this part I'm trying to pull down this way, how does that work? So what we need, um, to, we need some kind of bridge. Like this to connect the two pieces. So let's draw it. Uh, let's see, u equals zero, u equals pi. Right, so we're going up like this, coming down, there's this. We need something that sort of goes like that. And so now to get that, this is where the saddle point is gonna come into play. I mentioned um, that we, we need to do some kind of connection like this. And ideally, this curve right here should itself be a curve of constant, should be a contour. Um, should be a curve of constant psi. That would be great if we could do that. And so, right, because those are the, again, curves of steepest descent for the function. So let's look for such a thing. Um, 
psi equals constant. We already wrote down an expression for psi. Psi equals constant, what was our expression? It's sine of u cosh v. And so we have to figure out what curve we want to draw through there. And to do that, um, it's really helpful. I mean, to plot these various contours, this is not an obvious contour. You could ask Mathematica or something, draw the contour map in the UV plane of sine u cosh v, right? That's an interesting little problem for multivariable calculus. Draw that function as a, what are the, the contours of sine u cosh v gonna look like? So to plot those, um, we could just ask, like I say, you could just ask the computer to do it. But let's do it old school for a minute. I think it's instructive. Um, to plot contours of that sort of by hand, it's helpful. We know that we're gonna get some kind of saddle point. We already talked about that. And um, the saddle points can guide your eye because you know what the contours look like near a saddle. They look like hyperbolas or straight lines if you have asymptotes. So it's helpful to, um, to look for saddle points. So uh, what's a saddle point gonna look like? I mean, that's gonna be a place where Think about it as if it were multivariable calculus. If you looked at the gradient of this function, the gradient of the scalar function sine u cosh v, that means partial with respect to u of sine u cosh v, comma, the partial with respect to v of the same thing, that vector. So, uh, and we want both of those to be zero at a saddle point, both components to be zero. So let's take the first one, that'll be cosine u cosh v equals zero. And we also need from the other second derivative, uh, taking the cosh, taking the derivative with respect to v, derivative of cosh is cinch. So we'll get, sine u cinch v equals zero. And so you wanna solve that simultaneously. Remember, cosh of u is never zero. So that tells you cosine of u is zero. And so this is giving us u equals pi over two as advertised halfway across in the interval and sine of zero is zero. You want v equals zero. So this is our saddle point. We could have also just done it more directly with the function rho of t, look where rho prime of t is zero. Um, either way, that's just gonna give us um, a point right here at pi over two on the axis. All right, so that's our interesting saddle point. And also since remember, we're trying to understand the contours near that point, let's expand locally around that point to see what the contours look like. Um, actually at that point, I mean, let's see what the value of psi is. What contour are we talking about? Psi, which we said was sine u cosh v. That'll be sine of pi over two cosh of zero, that's one. So we're interested in the contour level one. And so um, to sketch this, So to sketch the curve where um, G 
which one do I want? Sine of u cosh of v equals one. Let's um, expand around the saddle point. in Taylor series. So just to understand locally what's happening. All right, so like for instance, we could say, let's suppose U minus pi over two is a small quantity, let's call it S. And, um, Right, so I'm thinking I'm, I'm near this point. I only perturb a little bit in the U direction by an amount S and V, which is this vertical variable is small to begin with. We're on the, the axis where V is zero. So V is itself small. So think of this um, S as being a small number and V is also a small number. So if we did that, then our psi is sine of u, which is sine of pi over two plus s. And we have cosh of v. And so then you can simplify that. This is cosine of s, cosh of v. And that's supposed to equal one if we're on the contour of interest. But expanding that, now with Taylor series for small s, this is one minus s squared over two. Cosh of v has a Taylor series one plus v squared over two plus other junk. Let's just go up to quadratic order, that's enough. Um, and that's all supposed to equal one on the contour of interest. And when you multiply that out, you get one minus s squared over two plus v squared over two plus higher order stuff is all equal to one. And so you can see that the um, s squared and v squared terms have to cancel because these ones cancel each other. And so you get the very nice little clean result that s equals plus or minus v locally, what I'm trying to say is that my contour picture looks now like this. I had this vertical line with a psi equals zero. I have another vertical line with a psi equals zero, right? This was over at, this is u equals zero, this is u equals pi. And what I've just derived is that I have some kind of little x configuration here in the middle. I didn't quite draw it in the middle. Let's move that over a little bit. Looks a little better. Where on this contour, we have psi equals one. On there. Now, that's only just a little piece of the picture. So what is the whole picture? And I mean, the whole thing really makes me feel like an old man. I ought to just be doing this in Mathematica, but okay, just sticking with it from, from earlier times, this is how we would have done it. We have these contours. This one that comes through here ends up asymptotically going down and like that. This is my psi equals one. There's also on the other side, um, I mean, after all I have an X, psi equals one comes in two branches. There's also a, the other piece of the X, which goes through here like this. And over here, and then what do the other contours look like? You can sort of guess what they're going to look like by continuity. They're going to look sort of like this. 
So this would be, um, it turns out a, a typical guy with psi between one and zero. So this will be a psi less than one, looks like that one that I just drew. And something with psi greater than one looks sort of like this. or this. And here's another one with psi less than one. OK, so that's the contour map for the function psi. And you can verify that in a computer. That's right. OK, now let's go back to what we were doing. We're trying to um, find the, the integral of our original, <laughs> you know, we had this, this integrand, we're trying to understand the higher order terms in the Bessel function. And what we've now determined is that a good path is going to be something that looks like so. It's going to start here at this endpoint. It's going to go up along this contour. I want to go through the saddle point because that's gonna end up making a dominant contribution to the whole integral. But to get there, I will follow this curve of steepest descent. We already determined that to go downhill, we had to be going this way over here. So we're gonna go up then we're gonna make some little piece. that's gonna jump us onto that contour of interest. I'll do that by going across at some constant height, big V like we did in a previous calculation. And that's gonna end up contributing transcendentally small terms to the integral in the end. Everything's gonna be dominated by the neighborhood of that one point. We'll see. But anyway, so then I proceed along here, still going um, downhill. Through the saddle point. And I'll come down here and then jump over in a symmetrical way just to make the calculation easy and then come back to my other endpoint. So let's, so what I got is a contour made of five pieces. I'll call this one C1, here's C2. This piece going through the saddle point is C3. C4 down here and C5. And to finish this off, we're going to um, estimate the integrals on the various pieces. All right, I'm getting a little low on time. So um, we're going to use this contour We are going to let this quantity big V go to infinity. Um, and when we do that, we can check. Not sure I should spend time checking this. It's not the most interesting part of it. But we can check that I2, the integral of the original problem on this curve C2, um, that's going to go to 0. as big V goes to infinity, this will be big V, the negative of big V down here. It's also gonna be the case that I4 will go to zero. These are gonna give us transcendentally small terms. So maybe I'll leave that as a little exercise if we have time or if you feel like doing it later. I don't think that's the heart of it. Um, the real heart of it is to figure out what's going on as we go through the saddle. By the way, I1 and I5, are also not going to contribute the, the parts from the vertical segments because not because they're small, but because they're going to be pure imaginary. Let's see. and remember, in the end, we're supposed to take the real part of something. I I one and I five are pure imaginary. Let's just quickly check that or maybe I should say it this way, they're pure imaginary. And so they don't affect what we're interested in, which is J zero of X 
which as we said at the outset is one over pi, the real part of the integral that we're currently focusing on one over pi zero to pi e to the i x sine t dt. All right, they don't enter the real part. Now let's just see that they are pure imaginary. I mean, for instance, I one, that would be one over pi integral from zero to infinity. I believe we have an extra one over pi. G0. I'm sorry, what? I think you have an extra one over pi g0 as because you put it as a perfector before and after taking the real part. Um, did I? Oh, you're right. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, absolutely right. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Good catch. Yeah, thank you. Good. So um, e to the i x sine. Thank you, Maria. Um, when I'm moving along this vertical direction, uh, remember it's u plus i v. So my t just becomes i v, and my u is zero on that on that axis that we're interested in. And so the dt will just become i dv, and just collect the, the necessary powers of, I mean, you can see there's an i coming out from here. And everything else is giving me something real. So zero to infinity, um, e to the minus x, cinch v dv. So like I say, that's, um, pure imaginary and similarly I5 is also. So returning to the picture, I get pure imaginary contributions from this side, from over here. I get negligible from this and this. And what remains is to understand what's happening on this path, the path through the saddle point. And now we're all set up to use Laplace's method because since we're on a curve of constant phase, we could pull that phase outside the integral and we're ending up doing a Laplace's method calculation, um, which you know, at the end of the last lecture, I pointed out that in using Laplace's method, rather than parameterizing the whole curve exactly, the curve of steepest descent, you could just look at a little tangent vector through the point of interest. And so I'm gonna do that trick that'll speed things up. Um, so that's how we'll finish here. So as X goes to infinity, which is what we're interested in, the integral over C3, this part going through the saddle point, is dominated by the contribution um, from the saddle. And then as before, like we did at the end of lecture six, um, it's okay to replace the whole fascinating curve C3 by just an infinitesimal tangent uh, segment at the saddle point itself. a little segment along the tangent line. So let's do that. What I'm saying is in this picture where I've got V and U, um, I can come here through pi over two along this whole curve that I had earlier drawn, that interesting piece of the uh, hyperbola. I'm just gonna do that and then I'll kind of just I don't care about what's in the dot, dot, dot. 
that is, I'm going to think of this, let me sort of parameterize it like this. Let's call this R equals minus epsilon. And this will be R equals plus epsilon, where what I'm doing is I'm writing T, my complex variable going through the saddle point in the form, well, ram it through the saddle point. So it's T equals pi over two. And then just do something that's going in the correct direction. Now that direction is a line with a slope of um, negative one. That's the line. If I write it as a complex number, it's one minus I, right? Go over one and down to I, and then times a scalar R, which moves me along that tangent direction by any amount I want. And I let R only go from minus epsilon to epsilon. So that gives me this little infinitesimal piece through the saddle point. And so let's do that where R is restricted to lie between minus epsilon and epsilon. So that's what I mean about going through on the tangent. And then if I substitute that in, um, then we're gonna get the integral of e to the i x sine t dt over c3 is asymptotic. This is the first place where asymptotics are happening. Um, asymptotic to what I get by just substituting in this little tangent approximation. So I'm going from r equals minus epsilon to epsilon e to the i x sine substitute in this expression for t. So pi over two plus one minus i times r. And then I have to write dt, which will be one minus i dr. So I see I've gone a little bit over time, but I'm just gonna keep finishing. If you do need to leave, um, please feel free to leave and um, you could catch this on the video later. But for those who can stay, let me just finish it off. It'll just take another couple of minutes. Um, so here, well, it looks messy as it always does, but remember the strategy, we're just gonna to try to expand um, using the idea that this is a local calculation, we can use Taylor series. So let's do this as follows. Let's say sine of pi over two plus one minus I R, where R is a small quantity. Well, first of all, that's just cosine of one minus I R. And then I can expand that for small R to one minus the quantity one minus i all squared over two times r squared. Let me go out to fourth order, one minus i to the fourth power over four factorial. I mean, maybe just to remind you, it's a Taylor approximation. I'll put the factorials in um, and then r to the fourth and then higher order terms that I don't need. So there's some complex arithmetic to expand stuff out. If after you do it correctly, it comes out to be um, one plus i r squared minus one sixth r to the fourth plus higher order junk that we don't need. Okay. Um, and so my integral over C3 then is asymptotic to the integral from minus epsilon to epsilon e to the i x substitute in the Taylor series one plus i r squared minus a fourth r to the fourth dot 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 um, one minus i dr Right. I mean, hopefully conceptually it's all clear. We're now just doing Laplace's method around this tiny interval around the saddle point on this tangent direction. And everything is starting to look like Gaussian integrals. Hopefully you can see that. If you pull out the constants, 
what are we getting? One minus I, uh, there's a factor e to the i x that doesn't depend on the r minus epsilon to epsilon. Um, actually, it's convenient. Well, okay, I'll write it like that. Uh, actually, let me use the fact that I've got evenness with respect to r, right? I like to go two times an integral from zero to epsilon, so I'll do that. Actually, let me erase. Make that a zero, put out a factor of two. Um, zero to epsilon, I took out the e to the i x. When I multiply the e i x times the i r squared, I get e to the minus x r squared. And uh, then there's also an e to the minus i x r to the fourth over six. Um, oh, wait a second, I, I wrote a fourth, I meant a sixth back here. Maria, you're, you're, not, you're not on me. That's a six right there. <laughs> the, the rushing at the end that always happens. Um, and then dr, I think I'm good. Is this all okay? Yeah, I think it's okay. So you can probably guess what I want to do now. I have something that looks nasty because it's zero to epsilon as an integral, but I know how to do Gaussian integrals from zero to infinity. So I'm going to replace epsilon with infinity as we so often do in these things, because that's the beauty of Laplace's method, right? That only penalizes us by adding in transcendentally small terms away from this sharply peaked integrand. So with reckless gleeful abandon, I go zero to infinity, e to the minus x r squared, and it's still all correct. Um, and now I expand this next term in Taylor series, but not the e, the first term. I need that Gaussian bell, but not these other terms. These guys, that exponential can be expanded and still give, this is a Watson's lemma move that we use in Laplace's method. This is all correct still. Uh, and, right, I mean, there's this crazy thing with the replacing the epsilon to infinity. This was at the cost of Right, this only introduces transcendentally small terms. So it's okay. And okay, since I'm, I'm in taxing your patience by going over, let me just say these integrals are now just standard Gaussian integrals and do them however you like in the computer or by hand or with gamma functions or whatever. And after you simplify things, like for instance, this one minus i uh, that we see out in front here, this would give us a square root of two and e to the minus i pi over four, that's this times other stuff. So um, here's the answer. skipping a bunch of steps, but you can check that what this will give you is that J zero of X is asymptotic to, comes out to be square root two pi over X times cosine X minus pi over four. That's That would be coming from this first integral, this one times the one. And that's the stationary phase result. But then this term, when we integrate it against that, is going to give us the correction term, which turns out to be plus one over eight X sine 
of x minus pi over four. And we could do more terms by expanding that other exponential out higher if we wanted to, but let's just leave it at that. This is the correction term. So, you know, I'm not sure there's much point to this because as we already saw, the one term stationary phase does very well for approximating the Bessel function. But um, just so you know, in principle, how you could do it, this is how you can do it. Okay. I better stop there. Thank you.